Hi everyone, I'm Jess. For those of you who don't know me, I've been teaching these kind of tutorials, private tutoring, um, running crash courses for many, many, many years now. And I actually really, really like Calc 2. Those of you who had me for Calc 1, um, hopefully you found it helpful. That's why you're back. Uh, but believe it or not, my passion actually is in Calc 2. So we're going to have some fun here. Now, first and foremost, most important, please write down my email, okay? So that if you have any questions outside the session, you can feel free to message me. Obviously, I'm just going to make a disclaimer. I can't help you with specific assignment questions or, you know, test questions, that kind of thing. But I can help you with any other questions you find. Like, let's say you're working through some textbook questions and you're like, I don't know why I got this wrong. Like, you can email me um, then, okay? We have a lot of topics to cover today because um, we're trying to catch up a little bit on the previous three weeks. I know that during week one, you guys did an integration review and improper integrals. I'm actually not covering that today. The reason is I want to make sure we cover enough stuff for you guys who need help with the assignments. I know assignment two is due today at midnight, right? So I'm gonna cover some stuff in case you still have some attempts on your assignment and you need a little bit of help there, this tutorial should help. I'm also going to try my best to cover as much as possible for assignment three so that um, I think the due date is next Monday, right? For assignment three, so that that way you would have enough knowledge to do that assignment, okay? So let's dive right in. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A that's at the bottom of Zoom there. Just click on Q&A, pop the questions in there, and I will answer them. But let's get started. You should have access to this booklet. We are going to start with sequences, uh, which pretty much makes up the bulk of your assignment two. And then we're going to dive into series. There's a couple questions on assignment two related to series, but majority of the questions will show up on assignment three. Okay, let's get started. What is a sequence? Well, before we talk about sequence, we actually have to talk about some notations because math people are all about notations. We're really lazy. So instead of writing out, okay, A1 plus A2 plus A3 all the way up to AN, these A are just terms, these are numbers. I'm going to use this giant sigma notation. This means I'm going to add up a bunch of things. I'm going to add it up where the index changes from 1 to N. And there's some common sums here that you guys kind of learned in Calc 1. We don't really use this in Calc 2. We don't use it as much on your assignments. I don't think you need to use it. I checked through it. But um, there is a common sum out there called telescoping sums that you will see quite a bit on your assignment. Telescoping sums, how do we tell that it's a telescoping sum? You're going to have a sum of two things, thing one and thing two, and they're going to be subtracted. And how a telescoping sum works is that all of the middle things are going to be canceled out because you're subtracting a bunch of things. Okay, I'll show you what I mean in the question below, um, but just hang tight. I will go through what a telescoping sum actually looks like, but it's a sum of two things that are being subtracted. Okay, there is another uh, basic thing that you need to know. Uh, it does show up on your assignment as well. It's called mathematical induction. So induction is used to prove if a statement is true. Now, I know in class, most profs are teaching you induction in two steps. There's the base case, and then you do the induction. I like to break it down into three steps. I find it makes it a little bit clearer. So I'm going to show you how to do a mathematical induction in a second. But pretty much, uh, there's three parts to it. You want to show the base case. So you want to show that the statement is true for when n equals 1. And then you want to make a hypothesis. So I'm going to say, OK. Let's pretend that the statement is true up to n equals k. And then you're going to do your induction step, which is let's show that the statement is true for the next step, which is the k minus one, uh, k plus one step. OK, I'll show you how to do a mathematical induction, but let's start with some sigma notation stuff. So questions like this, as we're doing them together in these tutorials, will really help with your assignment. All right. So we want to evaluate the sum where i goes from 3 to 50 of 1 over i minus 2 squared minus 1 over i plus 2 squared. So notice that I have two things that are being subtracted. So likely, this is going to be some kind of telescoping sum. So when you're given a sum like this, how would you evaluate it? Well, you can break this up into two sums. So I can have the sum where i goes from 3 to 50 of 1 over i minus 2 all squared minus the sum where i goes from 3 to 50 of the second guy. So that's 1 over i plus 1 all squared. 
So when you have a plus or minus inside a sum, you're allowed to break it up into multiple sums like this. And now let's actually figure out what happens when i equals 3, i equals 4, i equals 5, and so on. So when i equals 3, I'm going to put in 3 for my i, and I get 1 over 3 minus 2, that's 1, right? So 1 over 1 squared plus, okay, let's figure out what happens when i equals 4. Well, when i equals 4, I have 1 over 4 minus 2 is 2, so 2 squared. Plus, let's list out the next one, when i equals 5. So that's 1 over, um, what is that, 5 minus 2 is 3, 3 squared. You can list out a few of these. So I'm just going to list out a couple more since I see what the pattern is. Let's pretend we stop there. And then we're going to keep adding this. And I personally like to write down what happens, not just at i equals 50, but I like to go back a few terms as well. So let's pretend when i equals 48, what happens? Well, it's going to be 1 over 48 minus 2 is 46 squared. Then we're going to have 1 over 47 squared. And then finally, when i equals 50, we're going to have 1 over 48 squared. Right? So this is what we get from the first sum. Now we're going to minus the exact same thing, but the second sum. So again, when i equals 3, Write it down. What do you get? Write down the first few terms, the last few terms. I want you guys to write that down right now, okay? When you're done writing it out, if you don't mind just putting your hand up so I know when I can start taking it up with you. Remember, you're not doing any calculations. You're just writing it out. What happens when i equals 3, i equals 4, i equals 5, all the way up to i equals 48, 49, 50. Okay, quite a few of you guys have your hands up. If you're still writing it out, that's okay. You can try it again after, after the session as well, but I wanna get through more questions with you. So I'm just gonna write this out now. So for this second sum, when i equals three, I'm gonna replace the i with a three, I'm gonna get one over four squared. Then when i equals four, it's gonna be one over five squared. And you kind of see the pattern, right? It's gonna be one over six squared, one over seven squared and so on. And then when i equals, uh, let me do, let's say 47, okay, go back a few terms, or sorry, 48, right, let's, doesn't matter, you can start at 47, 48, but let's say when i equals 48, you're going to have 1 over, 48 plus 1 is 49 squared, and then 50 squared, and finally 51 squared. And this is what I mean by it's a telescoping sum. Think of a telescope. You can kind of collapse it, right? Make it smaller. That's exactly what's going to happen here. So a lot of these terms will cancel. So 1 over 4 squared, 1 over 5 squared. So all of these middle guys will pretty much all cancel out, right? And you'll just be left with the first few terms minus the last few terms. So this one becomes 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared minus... 1 over 49 squared plus 1 over 50 squared plus 1 over 51 squared. And at this point, if you're doing a question like this on the assignment, for example, you punch in a calculator and what is it? I think they want you to round to six decimal places or something like that. Just read the instructions and that's what you'll be doing. Okay. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. We're just getting used to this summation notation and introducing you to something called a telescoping sum like this. All right, if there's any questions, let me know, but I do want to move on to some other concepts here. Next up, we have mathematical induction. So, like I said, mathematical induction is used to show that a statement is true. So we want to show that the sum where i goes from 1 to n of 2i minus 1 equals n squared using mathematical induction. So step one, we have the base case, meaning when n is the smallest number possible. 
So when n equals one. All right, so let's start there. On the left-hand side, we have the sum where i goes from one to n, but now n is one of two i minus one. Well, what happens when I add up two i minus one where i goes from one to one? i is, is just gonna be one number, right? It's just gonna be one. So when i equals one, we're gonna have two times one minus one, which is one. And let's see what happens on the right-hand side. The right-hand side is n squared, but n is one, so that's one squared, which is also one. So check that out. Left side equals right side, so the base case is true. We're done step one. So you always want to check the smallest possible number for n, and most of the time that's going to be when n equals one. That could technically change. For example, if their sum started at i equals three, then your base case would be when n equals three. If their sum started when i equals seven, then your base case would be when n equals seven, okay? Step two, we have our hypothesis. So hypothesis, we are going to just let n equal k every single time. I don't care where your i starts, your hypothesis is always when n equals k. So we are going to assume that this statement is true for n equals k, meaning we're gonna assume that the left side the sum where i goes from one to k of two i minus one is going to equal k squared. We're assuming that, that's our hypothesis, okay? Step three, this is where we actually do the work, where we actually do the induction step. So meaning we wanna show that this is true for when n equals the next number, which is k plus one, okay? So again, let's do left side equals right side. So left side, we have the sum where i goes from one to n, n is now k plus one. And what was it? Two i minus one. So let's put that down. Well, think about what this sum actually is. It means we're gonna add up two i minus one for when i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, all the way up to k plus one, right? So essentially, I can break this up into two parts. I can break this up into the case where i goes from 1 to k plus the last term where i is k plus 1. So the first k sums is just going to be the sum where i goes from 1 to k of 2i minus 1. And then this last one, when i is k plus 1, I'm going to replace i with a k plus one. And this is very standard when it comes to the induction step. We always wanna break it down so that we see the first one to k terms together. Because guess what? We made an assumption, right? Our hypothesis was that the sum of the first k terms is k squared. So we're gonna use that and we're gonna replace this sum of the first k terms as k squared. Okay, let's simplify this messy looking thing. We have k squared plus two times k is two k, two times one is two minus one, so that's a plus one. Okay, so that's what we get on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, the statement was um, n squared, right? I'm just gonna scroll back up. So the statement was n squared, but now we're letting n be k plus one. So on the right-hand side, it's k plus one squared. And guess what? If I expand this out, k plus one all squared, k plus one times k plus one is gonna give you k squared plus two k plus one, which is the exact same thing as the left-hand side. So therefore the statement is true. Okay, so that's how induction works. Now for your assignment, um, from what I saw, you guys aren't required because it's a lot of it is, uh, you know, fill it in, multiple choice type thing. Um, you didn't have to do a full induction question. Instead, they asked you, hey, what was the hypothesis? What did you have to show? That kind of thing, okay? So we'll see some examples like that later on as well. But I just wanted to go through induction. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you guys feel at least a comfort level of eight out of 10, at least eight out of 10 on induction and the summation notation stuff that we just did, the sigma notation? 
Awesome, thank you. Good, good number. I'm gonna lower these hands. How many of you guys feel at least like a five or six out of 10? Like you kind of get it, but you just need a little more practice maybe. Oh, a little bit of split with the first group. Okay, good to know. We're gonna have more of this practice. Don't worry, induction is gonna come back again. I know it's a new topic that not a lot of you guys have seen prior to this course, but I do wanna move on so that we can go through more concepts together, okay? All right, now let's talk about sequences. Now that we have induction in mind, we have the sigma notation, we can talk about a sequence. A sequence is just a fancy way of saying you have an ordered list of numbers. So I have the numbers here and there's some kind of order to them, okay? And the numbers in this sequence are called terms. So from now on, if I say a term, I mean a single number in a sequence. The most basic sequence that we all know, we actually learned it way back when we were kids, is counting. We have one, two, three, four, five, counting the numbers, the positive integers. That is a sequence because it's just a collection of numbers. And each of these things is called a term. So this first one is called the A1, the first term. This one is A5 and so on. Okay. So we can actually write out the sequence like this. But a lot of times what's going to happen is your prof and on the assignments and the tests on the midterm, you're actually going to see AN instead. They're gonna give you the general AN term, okay? They might put from one N equals one to infinity, or they might put nothing around the curly brackets. It still means that you have a sequence that goes on forever, okay? Now, there are some common sequences that you need to know because knowing these sequences will help you with a lot of the questions. There's the arithmetic sequence. They don't ask a lot of questions. I didn't really see any questions like this for the assignment, but Arithmetic sequence, you pretty much start with a number, and then to get to the next number, you're going to add a constant D. And to get to the next number, you're going to add the constant again, add the constant again. So for example, this sequence here starts with one, and then notice what's happening. I'm going to four by adding three. I'm adding three again to get to my seven, adding three again to get to the 10, adding three again to get to the 13. So I'm just adding three. So in general, the a nth term is going to be your first number, a, plus n minus 1 times d. So having a form like this really helps because then if I want you to find, hey, what's going to be the 10th number, the 10th term in the sequence, I don't have to go and count out what the 10th term is. I can just use the formula. It's going to be the first number, a, which is 1, plus n minus 1, so that's 10 minus 1, times d, which is 3. So if you actually calculate this out, this is one plus nine times three, which is 28. So I don't have to sit there and count out 10 numbers. I can just plug it in the formula, okay? Another very important uh, sequence is a geometric sequence. So very similarly, you start with the number A, but this time to get to your next number, you're not gonna add, you're gonna multiply by a common ratio R. So to get from a two to a four, I'm gonna multiply by two, I'm doubling. And I multiply by two again to get to the eight. Multiply by two to get to the 16. Multiply by two to get to the 32. So I'm just multiplying by two. So then the nth term, the a n term, is going to be a times r to the n minus one. We're going to see this come back later on when we talk about series. Okay. So just know that the nth term is a times r to the n minus one. So for example, if I wanted the tenth term, that would be my first term times r, which is two to the power of 10 minus one. And then whatever that is, that's my 10th number, okay? There's this third one as well that they used to teach, but I didn't really see it this year in the notes. How many of you guys have heard of the sequence, the harmonic sequence? How many of you have heard your prof talk about this? Well, quite a few of you actually. So maybe I just didn't see it in the notes that I got, but that's totally fine. Harmonic sequence is really important, especially later on when we talk about series. The harmonic sequence looks like this. It starts with a one, or you can think of it as one over one. Then it's one over two, one over three, one over four, and so on. So the nth term is one over n, okay? So keep those in mind, the common three sequences, arithmetic, geometric, and harmonic. Okay, now what do we do with the sequence? Like they're not gonna ask you, hey, write out the first 10 terms of a sequence. That's too easy, they're not gonna do that. Instead, they're gonna ask you if a sequence converges. The word converge, from now on, when you hear the word converge in this course, it just means it becomes a finite number, okay? So like the number three or the number five over two, the number negative 17. 
So what happens is that if you have a sequence of numbers, a n, it converges if the limit as n goes to infinity of each of the terms equals l for some finite number l. So in plain English, what this means is you have this list of numbers. If the numbers get really, really, really close to some number l, then we say that the sequence converges. And the opposite is true. If the sequence diverges, that means that the limit doesn't exist. So that could mean that, okay, I'm not approaching a single number. So let's say the terms bounce back and forth between negative two, positive two, negative two, positive two. If that happens, then it doesn't converge to a single number, then it diverges. It can also go to infinity. If the limit of each term goes to either positive or negative infinity, we say that the sequence diverges to positive or negative infinity. Okay. So the questions that they can ask you, and that they did on the assignment was, okay, what is the limit of a sequence or does the sequence converge? So let's take a look at some questions here. And these ones will really help you if you're struggling with the assignment. So do these sequences converge? If it does, we want to state what it converges to. So first we have the harmonic sequence where each term is one over n. So if they're asking if a sequence converges, I am looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of a n, meaning I'm looking at the limit where n goes to infinity of one over n. So you got to think back to calc one last semester, all your limit stuff, okay? If you took my um, crash course last semester with calc one, my golden rule when it comes to limits is first do a direct substitution. So whatever this n value is, I'm going to replace it with infinity. So this essentially becomes one over infinity and one divided by a really, really, really large number is just zero. So the sequence actually converges because the limit equals a number and it converges to zero. Okay. Let's look at the next one. The sequence cos of n pi. So again, we do the same thing, looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of cos of n pi. But this one's a little tricky. If I substitute infinity in for my n, I'm essentially going to get cos of infinity. But cos of infinity, I, it doesn't, I don't know what it approaches. I don't know if it, it, it does approach anything, like it bounces back and forth. So normally when we were doing limits, we would say the limit does not exist. But for sequences, you have to check one more thing, because remember, for sequences, n is only integer values. n starts from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, goes all the way up to infinity. So I'm actually going to check to see what happens when n equals 1, when n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. So we have to do this extra checking step. So when n equals 1, I get cos of 1 pi. Well, cos of pi, if you think about your graph, or a unit circle, that's negative one. Then when n equals two, we have cos of two pi, which is a positive one. n equals three, negative one again, and then it's gonna keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't approach a single number, so therefore it diverges. I wanna give you guys a minute or two. Try number or part C by yourself. So this sequence is cos of pi by two times two n plus one. So you want to see if the sequence converges. If it does, you want to figure out what it converges to. When you're done, if you don't mind just raising your hand so I know when to take it off.
Okay, so some of you guys have your hands up. I know some of you guys are still trying. And I really, really wish I had all the time in the world and I don't have to rush you, but I do want to go through more questions with you because we're trying to catch up the first few weeks, right? So then from now on, we can go week by week. So I am going to start taking it up, but if you need a little bit more time to try it, hey, try it after the session, cover up the answer, see if you can do it, okay? So whenever we're asked if a sequence converges, first thing we're going to check is the limit as n goes to infinity. So it's essentially a limit question. And if the limit approaches a single number, we're done. It converges. But if not, then we have to double check when n equals 1, n equals 2, and so on to see if we get an answer. So I'm going to find the limit as n goes to infinity of this term. So that's cos of pi by 2 times 2n plus 1. And when you're evaluating a limit, the first thing you do is take whatever n approaches, plug it in for the n in the question. So this essentially becomes cos of pi by 2 times some kind of infinity. And cos of infinity, I don't know what's happening. So I can't say it converges. I can't say it diverges. I have to check to see what happens when n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 to see if I can have some kind of pattern happening. So when n equals 1, okay, you plug in the 1. So we end up with cos of pi by 2 times 2n, so 2 times 1 plus 1, so that's 3 pi by 2, right? So cos of pi by 2 times 3. Well, cos of 3 pi by 2, if you think about your cos graph or use a calculator, really, that's going to give you a 0, right? Cos of any multiple of pi by 2 really is going to be a 0. That's when it crosses the x-axis, right, at all of these points here. So the next one, when n equals 2, this gives us cos of pi by 2 times 4 plus 1, which is 5. Again, that's going to be 0. The next one is going to be cos of 7 pi by 2. It's going to be 0. Cos of 9 pi by 2 is 0, and so on. So every single number is just 0. So therefore, this one converges to 0. Okay? So always check the limit first. If the limit gives you a number, you're done. If the limit is kind of undefined, you don't know what's happening, you have to check this n equals 1, n equals 2 thing. All right. Let's do more of these because I know for the assignment, for example, they give you a ton of these for you to do. So we're given another sequence in D where the terms a n is 1 half ln n minus ln of n minus 5. We want to see if it converges or diverges. If it converges, we want to say what it converges to. So again, we're looking for the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms. So that's 1 half ln n minus ln of n minus 5. If you do a direct substitution with this one, you're going to end up with ln of infinity minus ln of infinity. Infinity minus infinity is undefined. We don't know what's happening. And there's a lot of ways to approach this. You can try doing like La Patel, that kind of stuff. But this is a lawn, right? So lawns, usually we want to use our lawn rules. Remember, there's a couple lawn rules here. First of all, if you have a, a constant, so a number that's being multiplied by a lawn, you can bring that up as an exponent. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n to the 1 half. And something to the 1 half is just the square root. So I'm just going to write it like this. Minus ln of n minus 5. And another ln rule says that when you're subtracting two lons, we end up dividing what the lons are. So this is ln of, I'm going to divide what's on the inside now. So I have the square root of n over n minus 5. Now, if we do a direct substitution, so I plug in n equals infinity, I'm going to get ln of infinity over infinity, which is still undefined. This is when, you know, you can use La Patel if you want to, because you do end up with an infinity over infinity somewhere. But I want to show you guys or remind you of a certain trick that you used in Calc 1. And that is whenever you have a function, a, a polynomial divided by another polynomial, so kind of a fraction going on, the limit as n goes to infinity of this polynomial over polynomial, there are three cases. Case number one, 
if the degree, sorry, the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator, the limit is just going to be plus or minus infinity. If the degree, oops, degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, the limit is just going to be zero. And the third one, if the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator, then we divide the coefficients of the highest degree terms. So hopefully you kind of remember this from Calc 1. This is a little trick we use for these limits. You're also going to see it later on when we're doing um, comparison tests when it comes to series, OK? How many of you guys remember this little trick, just so I know where we're all at? A good number of you, but a lot of you guys don't. That's great. So just gave you a trick to use. Thank you. OK. So if you look at what's happening in this rational function right here, I have something divided by something, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, right? Degree of the numerator is one half because it's a square root. The degree of the denominator is one. So the degree in the top is smaller, meaning that limit right here is gonna be a zero. So this is gonna be ln of zero. And specifically, it's going to be zero from the right because the term is positive, right? When n goes to positive infinity, I'm going to get a positive number inside that bracket. And ln of zero from the right, if you look at the ln graph, as I'm getting closer and closer to zero from the right, it goes down to negative infinity. So this limit is negative infinity, meaning that this sequence diverges to negative infinity. So it doesn't converge, it doesn't go to a single number, it diverges to negative infinity. So they're testing you on your limits as much as they're testing you on your knowledge of sequences. So let's take a look at part E. We have another term here, a n, and they'll do this a lot. They'll have this negative one to the n power type thing happening, and then they'll give you the, the term part. So n squared divided by e to the n. So what's happening here is for n equals 1, you're going to get a negative term. n equals 2, it's going to be positive. n equals 3, negative, positive, negative, positive. So it's just going to flip-flop back and forth. Whenever you're given a negative 1 to the power of n and you're trying to see if the sequence converges, take the limit as n goes to infinity, break up that negative 1 part, and then find the limit as n goes to infinity of the rest of the um, term. I don't really care what this limit is. It's going to bounce back and forth between positive, negative, positive, negative. So essentially, we want to see what's happening with the other part of the limit to see if it converges to a number. And then we can decide if the full thing converges to something. OK, so we have the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n. Just leave that aside. Don't touch it. And what happens to this other limit? If you do a direct substitution, we're going to end up with infinity over infinity. Right? So if it's infinity over infinity, I don't like that. That's indeterminate. But remember, when you have zero over zero or infinity over infinity, we can use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule says we find the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom, right? So go ahead, find the derivative of the top, find the derivative of the bottom, and then see if you can figure out what this limit is. I'm seeing some answers coming. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So they're forcing you to review some of the concepts from calculus one, right? So derivative of n squared is 2n. Derivative of e to the n is e to the n. But then if I do a direct substitution, I'm going to get infinity over infinity again. 
So guess what? L'Hopital's rule again, it happens. Sometimes you need it more than once. It's a useful tool. So we have the limit. Again, I'm not touching this negative one to the end. I know someone's asking about that, how we broke this up. I'll go through it in just a second. Just wanna finish this up first. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. In the numerator, the derivative of 2n is 2. Derivative of e to the n is e to the n. Now, when I plug in n equals infinity, I'm going to end up with the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n. And as n goes to infinity, I'm going to end up with 2 divided by a really, really, really large number. 2 divided by something really large goes to 0. So you see how it doesn't matter what this limit is? The limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n flip-flops back and forth between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. But I'm taking whatever that positive negative one is and I'm multiplying by zero. Anything times zero is just gonna be zero. So this one converges to zero. So I do wanna address this question now. So how did we know to break it up into two pieces like this? How can we do that? Well, whenever you have a limit of a function, it doesn't matter how many pieces there are. You can find the limit of each piece. So I'm thinking of this as two separate pieces. I have the negative one to the n part, which I know as n goes to infinity, the number part isn't gonna change. It's gonna be one, but the sign is gonna change back and forth between positive and negative one. And then I have this part, n squared over e to the n. Now, if you didn't want to, technically you don't have to break it up into two limits like this, but then whenever you took L'Hopital's rule, you would also need to find the derivative of negative one to the n, which is, super tedious, right? Because the derivative of negative one to the n would be n times negative one to the n minus one. And then the derivative of that, you would have to find it again. It's just super annoying. That's why I decided to break it off into its own little limit. And I wanted to see what the other part of the limit was. If the other part of the limit equals zero, then it doesn't matter that I'm flip-flopping between negative one times one times negative one times one, because it's all going to be zero. But Let's say that after you evaluated the limit, let's pretend that this limit here that you got was not zero. Let's pretend it was five. Then what they're saying is that your terms are actually gonna flip flop between negative five, five, negative five, five. So eventually if you list out all these numbers, it's not gonna converge. It's gonna keep bouncing back and forth, negative five, five, negative five, five. So then the sequence will diverge, okay? so. Whenever you have that negative one to the end, I just like to separate it, deal with everything else, and then come back to it after. Okay. All right, let's do one more here. We'll do this one together as well. So I have these terms and I want to see if they converge or if they diverge. So bring out your limit, limit as n goes to infinity of negative one to the n. And since I have this negative one to the n part, I'm going to leave that and I'm going to find the limit of the other part. Okay. All right. So again, whenever you have that negative one to the end, just leave it because it's really tedious if you want to incorporate it in your calculations. So just leave it on the side and see if um, the limit part equals zero. If the, if the other limit part equals zero, then it doesn't matter that I'm flip-flopping between negative one and one, the whole limit will converge. But if the limit part is something that's not zero, then the whole thing will diverge because flip-flopping back and forth between a negative and positive number is not converging, okay? So let's find this limit. If you do a direct substitution, we are going to end up with infinity squared, which is infinity, times sine of one over infinity. Well, one divided by a large number is zero, so that's sine of zero which is zero. Infinity times zero is also an indeterminate form and we can deal with it using L'Hopital's rule. And the trick here is you need to create a fraction, right? So I'm gonna leave sine of one over n on top and I'm gonna rewrite n squared as something over one over n squared. So essentially these two things are the exact same because when I'm dividing by one over n squared, I flip and multiply, right? But now I've created a fraction and when you do a direct substitution, you see that we get zero over zero. Now we can use L'Hopital's rule. So quick review on L'Hopital as well, right? 
So we have the limit of the first part. That doesn't change. And now we want to use Locatelle's. So write down what is the derivative of sine of 1 over n. Don't forget your chain rule. And then write down what's the derivative of 1 over n squared in the bottom. Hopefully you still remember your derivative rules. If you need a little bit of help with that, just let me know after the session, okay? Or send me an email and I can help you out one-on-one. -on -one. So let's uh, write this down because I do have quite a few different questions I want to go through with you guys. So the derivative of sine of 1 over n, well, derivative of sine, first of all, is cos. And then because of the chain rule, I need to times the derivative of the inside. So think of one over n as n to the negative one, and then you can use your power rule, right? Bring the power down, power minus one. So this is negative one times n to the negative two. Do the same thing for the bottom here. This is n to the negative two, and then use the power rule. You get negative two n to the negative three. This first part, the negative one to the n part, I'm not gonna touch it. But then we have the limit as n goes to infinity, cos 1 over n. Now I can simplify a bunch of things. The um, negative ones, they cancel, right? And then I have n to the negative 2 divided by n to the negative 3. So that's n to the negative 2 minus negative 3, right? Using your exponent rules. Negative 2 plus 3, that's 1. So this is times n. Oops, put that in blue. Now let's do a direct substitution. When I sub in n equals infinity, I get cos of 1 over infinity. So that's cos of 0 times infinity. Some people are like, oh, we have to use Locatelle again. No, you don't, because cos of 0 is 1. So this is 1 times infinity, which is infinity. So this whole thing just goes to 1 of the infinities. Sorry, I should actually write this down. You have the limit as n goes to infinity of negative one to the n times infinity, okay? Oh, sorry, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I did forget that one half, my bad, there's a two in the denominator, but infinity divided by two doesn't even make a dent, it's, it's still infinity, but thank you yeah, for pointing that out. So essentially what's happening is as n goes from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on, the number part is gonna go to infinity but the sign is gonna flip flop between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So it's not like it's approaching a single number and it's not approaching positive infinity or negative infinity. It's bouncing back and forth. So it doesn't converge at all. So this one actually diverges and it actually doesn't diverge to infinity, it just diverges, okay? So those are some basic sequences. That would be very helpful if you haven't done the assignment. Maybe I should see a show of hands. How many of you guys have completed assignment two already? I know it's due tonight at midnight. Okay, thank you. Just under half. So it will be helpful for those who haven't completed. If you completed, hey, that's okay. It's extra review for you. And then I will go over new stuff that you will use for assignment three. Okay. Okay, let's do question number four here. Suppose that the sequence is defined by a1 is 3, so the first term is 3. a n plus 1 is the square root of 12 minus a n. And we're told that this sequence is convergent, meaning it, it, meaning it converges. And we want to find its limit. Do me a favor, change the 12 into a 20. Otherwise, this is actually a really boring question. I'm going to make it into a more interesting question, which is we're going to change it to 20. 
leave it at, leave it as an exercise for those of you who are curious why is it boring when it's just 12 I'll let you guys try that out okay so we are told that it converges and we want to find its limit okay so i want to find the limit as n goes to infinity of a n whenever you're given a sequence that has a this is called a recursive formula because you're told that the next term depends on a previous term i like to write out the first few terms just to see what's happening so a1 is 3 we know that what is a2 well the next term is going to be the square root of 20 minus the previous term, right? Or you can think of this as, okay, when n equals one, I get a2 equals the square root of 20 minus a1, a n, which is a one, okay, the first term. And that is the square root of 17. You can use a calculator, turn it into a decimal if you want. And then I have uh, a3 is the square root of the previous term, which is, or sorry, the square root of 20, minus the previous term, which is the root of 17. And then a4 is the square root of 20 minus the previous term, which is square root of 20 minus square root of 17, and so on. So we're, we're getting these nested square roots. And essentially, you're asked to find the limit as n goes to infinity of a n. That's what they're asking. Well, they're telling us that the sequence converges, meaning that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is going to be a finite number. That's what it means to be convergent, right? It has to approach a single number. It can't bounce back and forth. It can't equal one of the infinities. It equals a number L. So, okay, what happens when I take the limit of this equation? So I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus one equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of 20 minus a n. Okay, this is what you're gonna do whenever you're given a sequence that's defined using a recursive formula like this. Sometimes it has a square root, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't matter. As long as they give you a formula for a n or a n plus one, you're gonna take the limit of both sides. Then what's going to happen is notice that as n goes to infinity, so if I sub in n is infinity, I'm going to get a single number L. So if I sub in n equals infinity, this A of infinity is going to be L. Same thing on this side. This is the square root of 20 minus, if I sub in n, in, n equals infinity, I'm going to get the number L. So essentially, all I have to do is solve this equation for L, and that is the limit. So let's go ahead and solve this. This is where they can give you a variety of different equations. It can look like a square root. It can be other different things. We just have to solve this equation. So getting rid of the square root, I'm going to square both sides. Oops, got rid of the square root. And now we get a quadratic relation. So I'm going to move everything to one side and factor. You can use quadratic formula. You can use completing the square. Factoring works for this one, so I'll just factor it. So we end up with um, L plus five times L minus four. So it seems like we get two answers, L equals negative five or L equals four. So if you're given a question like this on the assignment or on the midterm, do you enter both answers? What do we think? Don't answer both of them, because let's take a look at what's happening here. L is the number that equals the square root of 20 minus L. Square roots are always positive. I can't get a negative number, right? So I'm actually going to ignore this negative number. You ignore this one. This number came about because we had to square both sides, which then introduced another possible answer. But we know that L has to be the square root of something, so it has to be positive. Another way to think about it is look at this sequence of numbers you created. Every single number is the square root of something, so they're going to be positive numbers. So that's why the limit here is actually just the positive 4, and that's it. Okay? So this should help with uh, some of the questions that you're doing. Why don't we take a short break, um, and then we'll come back. So let's break.
and we'll come back at 7.35, so approximately 10 minutes, and then we'll pick it up and continue on. Now, I do have a huge favor to ask you guys, which is to fill out that 30-second survey for me. So let me just put that in the chat. So I just put the survey in the chat. If you guys don't mind, please spend 30 seconds just filling it out because it would really help us make the next session even better. Um, and to let me know how I'm doing, if there's anything you want me to change or keep going. Um, yeah. If you have any questions for me during break, just type it in the q and I'll be more than happy to help you out. I do see some hands up if, if you're, um, I'm gonna lower the hands now. <laughs> if you're raising your hand because you wanted to ask a question, like I can unmute your mic um, or you can type in the Q&A, both work for me. Oh, uh, someone's asking how much are the midterm and exam sessions? I'm not sure that the prices have been determined yet. That uh, I haven't heard from Robbie. So if you have specific questions, please email Robbie. I don't know how much they're going to cost, but usually we try to make it as affordable as we can, usually around like the 50, 60 mark, I think, for midterms, something like that. Um, but then the weekly tutorials today and next week are free. And then I think Robbie said they're still determining prices, but probably around 30, 35 for the weeklies. But yeah, feel free to message him. Uh, maybe he'll have more information soon. All right, welcome back everyone. We left off after question four. So now we're on page seven, our last little part on sequences and then we're gonna dive into series. Okay. Okay, so um, there's a couple of definitions that are important when it comes to sequences. One of them is called monotonic or monotone and the other one's called bounded sequence. So a monotonically increasing sequence or a monotone increasing sequence just means that the terms inside the sequence are just getting bigger and bigger. So A1 to A2, A2 is gonna be bigger or equal to A1. Then A3 is gonna be bigger or equal to A2. A4 is bigger or equal to A3 and so on. So you have your general AN term your a n plus one term is going to be bigger than your general a n term and so on. So your, your terms just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Monotone decreasing or monotonically decreasing is just the opposite. Your terms are getting smaller, okay? So a one is actually bigger than a two. A two gets smaller. A three is even smaller than that. A four is even smaller than that. And in general, uh, a n plus one is smaller than a n, okay? So that's what a monotone sequence is. Bounded sequence, there's two ways for a sequence to be bounded. You can be bounded from above or below, or of course, both above and below. But bounded above means that all of your terms are smaller or equal to some finite number m. So that means that a n in general is less than or equal to some number m. So that number could be five, it could be negative two, it could be three over seven. It's just some number, okay? Bounded from below means that all of your numbers are bigger than some finite number little m. So all of your a n terms are bigger or equal to little m. That's what a bounded sequence is, okay? And there are two important theorems when it comes to sequences. There's the squeeze theorem, which I'm not gonna spend too much time going over. It's the same squeeze theorem as your limits, okay? If you remember your limit squeeze theorem, that's what it is, it's not too fancy. But the monotonic sequence theorem is a little bit more important. It says that every bounded monotonic sequence is convergent. So in plain English, it means that if all your terms in the sequence fall between two finite numbers, so I have some m and some little m, and all of my terms are within these two numbers, so it's bounded, and the terms in the sequence are either always getting larger, it's monotonically increasing, or it's always getting smaller, it's monotonically decreasing, then the sequence has to converge to a finite number, okay? You can kind of see that in the picture, right? There's nowhere for it to go. If it's always going up or always going down, it's gonna reach a ceiling or a floor at some point, so it has to converge to that finite number, okay? So question number five uses a little bit of this idea here. So let's let a sequence be defined by A1 equals two, 
and a n plus one is this formula here. Part A, according to the monotonic sequence theorem, so that theorem we just talked about, what conditions must this sequence meet for it to be con uh, convergent? Well, remember the two, um, the two conditions are bounded and monotone, monotone, right? So in terms of bounded, it means that all of my ANs are going to be less than or equal to m and greater or equal to little m. Monotone, well, how would we know if the sequence is monotonically increasing or decreasing? Well, we're given the formula, right? So we can actually write out the first few terms to get a sense of what's happening. So I know that a1 is two. Let's figure out what a2 is. a2 is the next term. That's one third times two minus one, which is one third. A3 is the next term. That's one third times one third minus one. You can use the calculator or do a little bit of mental math here. So one third minus one is negative two thirds. A third of that is negative two ninths. And then A4, that's going to be one third times negative two over nine minus one. Negative two over nine minus one is negative 11 over nine. A third of that is negative 11 over 27, okay? If you're not good with fractions, don't worry about doing it in your head. Just write on a piece of paper or use your calculator. Check that out. But we can see that these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're getting more and more negative. So this sequence is going to be monotonically decreasing. For it to be decreasing, that means that my a n plus 1 term is going to be less than or equal to my a n term. I'm just going to write it like that so that it's in the order that we're used to seeing. Okay. So those are the two conditions that must be met. Now in part B, we're bringing in mathematical induction. And part B would really help with some of the questions that you guys are, are being asked. So if you wanted to use mathematical induction to show that the sequence meets these conditions outlined in part A, meaning that it's bounded and monotonically decreasing, what would be the hypothesis and the induction step? So I'm not actually proving it using mathematical induction. I just wanna write out the hypothesis and what step do I need to prove, okay? So try to write small here. I didn't give you guys the most space, that's my bad. But let's start with the bounded. So to show that it's bounded, my hypothesis, remember in mathematical induction, the hypothesis is we are going to assume that it holds, meaning that it's going to be bounded up to some n equals k. That's where the hypothesis comes from. So meaning I'm going to assume that a k is less than or equal to m and a k is greater or equal to little m. That's my assumption. And then in my induction step, I'm going to have to show that this is true for when n equals k plus 1. So I want to show that a of k plus 1 is less than or equal to m, and a k plus 1 is greater or equal to little m. I'm not going to actually show it. I just want to write down the hypothesis and the induction step, what we're trying to show. So that's how we would use mathematical induction to show that the sequence is bounded. Now let's do the same thing for monotone decreasing. I'll actually write it out. Decreasing. Okay. So the hypothesis, n equals k. We want to, sh uh, we, we're assuming that this is true, meaning it's monotonically decreasing for some n equals k. So that means that a k is greater or equal to a k plus one. But we can actually rewrite what this is because if you look at the question itself, let me just scroll back up. They told us what the um, a n plus one term is. That is one third of a n minus one, right? So that means that this a k plus one term, I can rewrite this. This is a k is greater or equal to one third of a k minus one. 
because AK plus one is the same thing as one third AK minus one, right? So that's our hypothesis that we'll be using if we actually had to carry out the induction step. And then the induction step, what we are trying to show is the case for when N equals K plus one, meaning we want to show that A um, K plus one is greater or equal to A K plus two. Because remember, monotonically decreasing means that a n is greater or equal to a n plus one. Okay. So I'm just replacing the n with a k plus one. And I'm giving you guys this kind of hint because you guys will need it is you can actually rewrite this again using this formula up here. It says that for any a n plus one, that's going to be one third a n minus one, meaning that whatever I put in here, that's just going to show up here. So this is one third a k minus one is greater or equal to. Now I'm going to bump it up one more. One third a k plus one minus one. So I'm allowed to expand it using that formula. Okay. So those are the hypothesis and induction step. A really good question came in here. Uh, does a sequence have to be bounded from both above and below for it to be convergent using this monotonic sequence theorem? Technically, no. If you know the trend of the sequence, for example, this particular sequence, we see that the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So technically, we just have to show that it's bounded from below because, again, if I draw a diagram, if my terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller. they're monotonically decreasing. I just have to show that it's bounded from below. There's a floor. And that's how I can show that this, the sequence does converge. But in general, let's say you don't have this formula at all. We don't know what's happening. Then you would have to show that it's bounded from above and below and or, or sorry, and then it's monotonic, okay? Then you can show that it's convergent. But for this one, just because it's, a, it's short to write out, I wrote out both. If you really wanted to, technically in your hypothesis, you don't really need this one. Um, you can just show that it's bounded below, okay? Okay, and that wraps up sequences. And that's majority of your assignment two. Now I'm gonna go into series, which will really help with your assignment three. And there's a couple questions in assignment two with series as well. All right, if there's any questions, let me know in the Q&A. All right, series. Let's talk about the basics of series. So what is a series? Now, if you're given a sequence of numbers, A1, A2, A3, and so on, one thing that we would like to do is actually add up all the numbers. So that's where we're using our sigma notation again. So we can add up all the numbers. So the sum where n goes from one to infinity of these ans. So you might be thinking, okay, Jess, what's the point of adding up a bunch of numbers, like won't I just get infinity? Not always, let's pretend that your sequence was zero, 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 then the sum of all your terms is zero. There are also other ways for the sum of the terms to actually equal a finite number. For example, if you're adding up one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, and so on, it actually does approach a finite number. And we're gonna see some common series later, so you're gonna actually be able to figure out what it adds up to. But just know that when you're adding up infinitely many numbers, you don't always get infinity. Sometimes you'll get a finite number, okay? Now, instead of adding up infinitely many numbers, we can add up the first n numbers. That is called the nth partial sum. So I'm not adding up all of the infinity that many numbers. I'm just cutting it off. I'm adding up the first 100 or the first thousand or the first 10. That's called the nth partial sum. And it's defined to look like this. S sub n is the sum where n goes from one to n of a n. So I'm just adding up the first n terms. Remember how we talked about sequence converges? If a sequence converges, that means that the limit of the terms approaches something. It's a little bit more complicated when it comes to series. We can't just find the limit of the terms and say that it converges. We have to figure out if when I add up all those terms, do I get a finite number? And this is how series convergence is defined. If you have a series, so I'm adding up A1, A2, A3. Remember, there's pluses in between, adding them up. If the limit of the nth partial sum equals a finite number, then it's convergent. Meaning that if I add up the first 10 terms, I get a number. 
if I add up the first 100 terms, I get a number. If I add up the first 1,000 terms, I get a number. And if I add up the first n terms as n goes to infinity, I get a finite number, then the series converges. And on the other hand, it diverges if the limit of the partial sums does not exist. So either it's undefined, it bounces back and forth, or it's one of the infinity, then it, it diverges. Okay. There's this little note here that personally, when way back, I'm dating myself, but way back in the day when I first learned sequences and series, I wish someone just straight up told me this here. I don't know why I, I, I got confused with this. So I'm hoping this might help some of you. What this is saying is that if a series converges, then a multiple of that series also converges. I know it sounds silly, but it took me a while to figure that out without me explicitly seeing it. So what I'm saying is, for example, let's pretend that the sum where i goes from one to n of, or sorry, uh, one to infinity of one over n squared converges. And it does converge, and I'm gonna show you why in a second. So this converges. Then what this is saying is that the sum where i goes from one to infinity of negative five over n squared also converges. So as long as the function or the sum itself converges, it doesn't matter if I multiply it by a number, it will still converge. Okay. Um, a question came in, would the series converge to the number you add with the nth series? Um, the series will converge to the limit of the um, partial sum. So you're adding up the first n terms. If you take the limit as n goes to infinity and you get that number, that is what the series converges to. Let me know if that makes sense. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question properly. Okay. All right, you have to, have to know these common series. Guaranteed, it's gonna show up a lot on your midterm. Also, it shows up on your assignment, okay? These are two common series. It's just like, remember how we looked at common sequences, arithmetic, uh, geometric, and harmonic? These are common series that you have to know. So there's the geometric series. And it looks like this, right? The sum where n goes from one to infinity of a r to the n minus one. Be very careful, it's n minus one. Sometimes they'll trick you. I've seen this on like past midterms and stuff. I've seen them change the index. So they changed it where n starts at zero. And if n starts at zero, then your term should be a r to the n. But it's rare, like I don't see this a lot. I don't even think I saw it on the assignment, but. I've seen it before, and so just wanted you to be aware. Okay, well, we'll do practice with majority of this one, but once in a while, we'll see the other one. So this is a geometric series, right? It's like your two, four, six, or sorry, two, four, eight, 16, when you're doubling or halving, like that kind of thing. When you're adding up a bunch of these terms, it turns out that if your common ratio R, if the absolute value of the common ratio is less than one, then it converges to a over one minus r. Please memorize that for me. If it's a geometric series, if the common ratio, the absolute value is less than one, then it converges to a over one minus r. If the absolute value of r is greater or equal to one, including equals one, it diverges. And there's another uh, common series here called the P-series. And checking your notes this year, it seems like some profs decided to teach it after they taught integral tests. But I'm going to just show you right now because this is very powerful, very useful. It says that when you have the sum where n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the P. So for example, if you have the sum where n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, it says that this is going to converge if p is greater than one. So in this example, p is two, that means it converges. And you can show this using the integral test, which we'll see later on, but it's a good series to memorize because it's gonna be very helpful for um, series questions. But then if you have n equals one for two infinity, one over, for example, n to the one, which is the harmonic series, right? Harmonic series, this one diverges. So if P is less than or equal to one, it diverges. Now here's the thing, P series is useful because it tells you when something converges or diverges when it looks like this, but it doesn't tell you what it converges to. It just says it converges, okay? 
Geometric series, on the other hand, is very powerful because it even tells you what it converges to. Let's sink our teeth into some questions now. Okay, so we learned partial sums so far for series, and we learned geometric and p-series, right? Cough, cough, hint, hint might be helpful later on when you're doing assignment three, maybe. <laughs> okay, so suppose that the partial sum of a series, the sum where n goes from one to infinity of a n is given by this. Sn equals 2n minus 1 over n plus 1, meaning if I add up the first n terms, I'm going to get 2n minus 1 over n plus 1. I want to determine if the series converges or diverges. Stay on this page. I'm just going to scroll back up. Look at the definition. It says that the series converges if the limit of the partial sums equals a finite number. So we are going to find the limit of the partial sums. I'm going to find the limit as n goes to infinity, this capital N of Sn. Be very careful. This is a common mistake I see students make. They get confused between series convergence versus sequence convergence. When I'm asking if a sequence converges, I'm finding the limit as n goes to infinity of a n. When I'm asking if a series converges, I'm looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn. Okay, difference. There's a difference there. So this is the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, Sn is 2n minus 1 over n plus 1. What is this limit? Evaluate it, write it down. What is this limit? Yeah, some answers coming in. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing with me. Makes me feel like I'm not just talking to a screen. So when we sub in n equals infinity, plot those in. Well, our fraction, we're going to end up with a 1 over infinity plus 1. So this one's 1 over infinity. And over here, I have a 2 times infinity, which is infinity. So I have infinity minus 1 over infinity. 1 divided by a really big number is 0. So this is infinity minus 0, which is infinity. So guess what? That is not a finite number. So therefore, the series diverges. Okay. So when it comes to looking at a series, if it converges or diverges, if you're given the partial sums, like you're given a formula for the partial sums, it's quite easy. It's like the same thing as sequence convergence. You're just finding the limit of Sn. Okay. Obviously, it gets harder later when they don't give you the formula, but we'll look at that. Next part, part B, we want to determine what is A5, so the fifth term. So common mistake I see students make is they sub in n equals 5 in Sn. So they do 2 times 5 minus 1 over 5 plus 1. Don't do that. Remember, A5 is the fifth term. S5 is the fifth partial sum, meaning A1 plus A2, A3, A4, up to A5. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. S5 is not the same as A5. S5 is A1 plus A2 a3, a4, up to a5. So I want to find a5 here. Meaning I want to somehow get rid of my a1, a2, a3, a4. Well, I can compare this to s4, which is a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4. And then you should be able to see how you can combine these two equations to get a5 by itself, right? Essentially, I want to get rid of the first four terms. So I'm going to subtract these two. So I get a, uh, S5 minus S4. All of these guys cancel. And you're just left with A5. So meaning that A5 is the fifth partial sum minus the fourth partial sum. And this is where the beauty happens because we're given the formula for these partial sums right here. We're told that Sn is 2n minus 1 over n plus 1. So S5 is 2 times 5 minus 1 over 5 plus 1 minus S4. That's 2 times 4 minus 1 over 4 plus 1. And how about I leave the calculation up to you guys, right? You can just crunch this up, and that will be the value of A5. All right, so that's how you can find a term in a sequence 
using the partial sum if you are given the formula of the partial sum. But you're not always going to be given that formula, okay? Okay, let's take a look at the next question. So in these questions, we are given a series, so the sum of some terms. We're not given the formula of the partial sums here. But we are asked whether these series converge or diverge. If it converges, we want to find the value it converges to. So looking at this first one, remember, so far we've only learned partial sums. We've learned geometric series, and we've learned p-series. I'm not given a partial sum, so there's nothing to do with partial sums. So I want to actually see if this is a geometric series or a p-series, and then I can decide if it converges or not. Well, this is in the form, the sum where n goes from 1 to infinity of a r to the n minus 1. So this is a geometric series. I want you to write down if it converges or diverges. And if it converges, what does it converge to? Go ahead and write that down, please. So hopefully this one wasn't too bad, right? We're just matching up the different things. So the A is the 2, R is the 0.3. So we see that A is 2, R is 0.3. And remember, for geometric series, to check if it converges or diverges, we look at the absolute value of R. If it's less than 1, it converges. 0.3 is definitely less than 1, so therefore it converges. And geometric series is one of the most powerful ones because we actually know what it converges to. It converges to a over 1 minus r, which is 2 over 1 minus 0.3. So that's 2 divided by 0.7. Punch it in the calculator or rewrite it as a fraction. Um, this is 20 over 7 if you rewrite it as a fraction, right? Okay. Okay, part B, decide if this uh, converges or diverges. Remember, there's no partial sum, so we're either looking at geometric or p-series. Decide on that. I want to get a quick vote so we can get through more of this question. Let me just get rid of this first. How many of you guys think that this series converges? So part B, who thinks it converges? OK. Thank you. Who thinks it diverges? Yes diverges. This one, I can rewrite this as the sum where n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the 1 half. This is a p-series. Remember your 1 over n to the p, where p equals 1 half, and that is definitely less than 1. For p-series, if the p-value is less than 1, it diverges. If it's less than or equals to 1, it diverges. If it's greater than 1, then it converges. Okay. All right, so that's the first two. Now let's look at part C. We're gonna do this one together because this one looks a little different. We look at it and we're like, okay, this is not a geometric series because there's no like some power to the N or some power to the N minus one. It's not a P series either though. P series is very clean. It's the sum where N goes from one to infinity of one over N to the P. But this has some other stuff in there. There's an N squared minus one. So the only other thing we can do at this point, actually, is to write out the first few terms. And I'm going to give you a hint for this one. This one, actually, you can rewrite it as a telescoping sum. And I think you guys have seen some of these examples in class. I've seen them in some of the uh, slides that you guys went through. So as weird as it is, we're actually going to do a partial fraction decomposition. Some of you guys who are really good at spotting fractions, you might not even need a partial fraction decomposition. You'll be able to just split it up. But for most of us, we're going to need the partial fraction. So this is negative 2 over, if you factor the denominator, that's an n minus 1 times an n plus 1. Okay. 
and go back to Calc 1 or when you did your integral reviews, partial fraction decomposition, when you have linear terms in the bottom, you just put a capital letter on top and split it up into multiple fractions like that. Okay, just to save us time, because I know you guys already did your integration review in class, I'm just going to skip through some of these uh, steps here. If you are struggling with partial fractions, just email me or stay behind after the session and I'll go through it with you. But essentially, after all the work, you're going to see that A equals 1, B equals negative 1. So we can now rewrite this series as the sum where n goes from 2 to infinity. Instead of it being one giant fraction like that, we can rewrite it as A over n minus 1. So that's 1 over n minus 1 plus B, which is negative 1, over n plus 1. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you expand out the first few terms, like three, four, five, six terms, and then see what happens. Something really nice is going to cancel out and you'll be able to see if it converges and what it converges to. Okay, so I'll leave it as an exercise for you to do. Uh, I'll give you the answer just in case you're, you're checking. Um, the answer is that it converges and it converges to negative three over two. Okay, I'll let you guys try that out. But I want to get through more questions with you. Okay, question eight. We want to determine whether this series, it looks messy. I don't know what's happening here, but there's a lot of fractions, converges or diverges. If it converges, we want to determine the, the value of its sum. So whenever you're given a series where you're not given the formula of the partial sum, you're not given the formula of the an term, instead you're given the first few terms, you want to try to spot some kind of pattern. So I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a lot of like 81s, 9s, 9s, 81s, 729. Those are all multiples of 3. And then I'm seeing some 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s. Those are all powers or multiples of 2. Right? So when it comes to a, a, a series, so far we only know partial sums, which we're not given the formula at all of the partial sum. We know geometric series, we know P series, and we also know um, telescoping sums, right? Well, this is definitely not a P series. P series is one over something, one over something, one over something. This is not it. So we're, my guess is that it's a geometric series. So let's check if it's a geometric series. Well, how do I check if something's geometric? For something to be geometric, the key thing is that from one term to the next, I'm multiplying by a common ratio r, right? I'm multiplying by r. So for me to find r, essentially I can just go backwards and divide consecutive terms backwards and I'll be able to find r. So if it was a geometric series, then if I divided 9 divided by 81 over 2, 2 divided by 9, the next term 4 over 9, let me just rewrite that nicer, 4 over 9 divided by 2, all of these terms should give me the same common ratio. So let me test them all out. 8 over 81 divided by 4 over 9. So if it was a geometric series, all of these should give me the same number. Let's simplify. When I'm dividing by a fraction, I flip and multiply, right? So this becomes 9 times 2 over 81. You can do some mental math here, right? 9 goes into 81 9 times. So this is 2 over 9, which is a good sign because it looks the same as the next fraction. This one, again, the 4 and the 2, they have a common factor. They divide out. So this is also 2 over 9. This next one is 8 over 81 times 9 over 4. Again, some things cancel out. And you see that you get 2 over 9. I sound like a broken record now, right? They all are 2 over 9, meaning that, yes, it's geometric. So if it's geometric, we have a way to tell if it converges or not. If the absolute value of r is less than 1, it converges. If it's bigger than, uh, if it's greater or equal to 1, then it diverges. So r here, if you look at this, is just your 2 over 9. And the absolute value is definitely less than 1. So therefore, it converges. 
And I want you guys to tell me which number does it converge to. I'm going to open up the polls just so you guys can vote a little bit. Figure out what it converges to and then select A, B, C, D, or E. Let me uh, go back up to the series for you so you can see the numbers. Remember the formula for convergence. If a geometric series converges, what is that formula? Just for time's sake, I'm going to give you guys about 10 more seconds. I know normally you'll get a lot more time, but I have a lot of questions I want to go through with you. All righty. Thank you for voting, everyone. That was amazing. Thank you. Yes. A lot of people voted for A, and A is the correct answer. Remember your formula here. If it converges, it's going to converge to A over 1 minus R. A is the first term in the series, right? So A is your 81 over 2. So 81 over 2 divided by 1 minus R, which is 2 over 9. Now, I saw some people select the negative answer as well. Be very careful with your algebra. This is 81 over 2 divided by 1 is 9 over 9. So divided by 7 over 9, it's a positive number. Okay, so you get 729 over 14. All right. Okay, moving on to question number nine. We want to find all the p-values such that this sum converges. So far, we only know partial sums, which this is not because they didn't give us a formula Fn, right? We know geometric series and we know p-series and telescoping sums. Well, this kind of looks like a p-series just because I have one over n to the power of something. So a general p-series looks like this. Let me write that down, p-series. If you don't have these memorized right now, that's okay. Just know them before your test, right? Is one over n to the p. And it converges if p is strictly greater than one. Not greater or equal to, not less than, it's strictly greater than one. It can't equal one. So if you look at our sum here, the power is one over p plus one. So that means this is going to converge, our series converges, if the power one over p plus one is greater than one. And then you just have to solve this inequality, okay? So to solve an inequality with a fraction, I like to flip the fractions. And when you flip the fraction, you flip the sign, right? One over one is still one. And then we solve for p by subtracting one. So p is less than one minus one is zero. So as long as p is strictly less than zero, not less than or equal to, not greater, p is strictly less than zero, then this um, series will converge, okay? So hopefully this helps. Knowing your p-series definitely I think is very, very helpful. Okay, now is when we get into all the different tests and there's a lot of them. So given a series, if they ask for if a series converges or diverges, if they're given the partial sums, you can find the limit. If it's a geometric or p-series, we can we, we know if they converge or diverge based on the conditions. But there's going to be a lot of series out there that are not as neat and tidy. So now we learn our first test to see if a series converges, and it's called the divergence test or the test of divergence. So consider any series AN. The first thing we want to do, this is the first test we want to do for any series from now on. We want to check the limit of the terms. So I know that limit of terms has to do with sequence convergence, but it turns out that if the limit as n goes to infinity of each term is not zero, that means that I'm eventually going to be adding up numbers that are non-zero. There's no chance that it's going to converge. Okay, so if the limit of the terms is not zero, then the series diverges. Be very careful. This test does not say the opposite thing. If the limit of the terms does equal zero, it does not mean that the series converges, okay? 
So that's why it's called the test of divergence because it tells us when a series diverges. So let's take a look at this example here. Determine if the series, um, the sum where n goes from one to infinity of n sine of one over n converges or not. You're gonna check the limit as n goes to infinity of each of the terms. If it doesn't equal zero, it doesn't stand a chance. It definitely diverges. If it equals zero, then there's a chance it will converge, but we still don't know for sure, okay? So checking this limit, if you do a direct substitution, you are going to get infinity times sine of zero, which is zero. That's undefined or indeterminate, sorry. So we have to try to use L'Hopital's rule. So I'm just gonna rewrite this. We have sine of one over n over one over n. So that when I flip and multiply, I'm not changing my question. Now we get zero over zero, use L'Hopital's. Oops, L'Hopital's. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. Now I need the derivative of the numerator. So use your chain rule, derivative of sine is cos. One over n is n to the negative one, right? And then we can find the derivative there. That's negative n to the negative two. In the denominator, same thing. So those actually cancel. So this leaves us with um, cos of one over infinity when I substitute the infinity, which is cos of zero. And that is one, not zero. So the instant that the limit of the terms does not equal zero, it diverges, okay? So tests of divergence will tell you when something diverges, but it can't tell you for sure if something will converge. We need more powerful tests for that, okay? But tests of divergence usually aren't too hard. You just find the limit of the terms, just like you would when you're trying to find sequence convergence. So I'm gonna leave number 11 as an exercise for you. I'll tell you right off of that, it diverges, but I want you guys to try it out using test of divergence, okay? But I wanna get into more juicy tests with you. And the next one is called the integral test, and you learned that last week. It will definitely be on your next assignment. So this is what the integral test says. You have some series where you're adding up a1, a2, a3, all the way up to a infinity, where a n is a sequence of positive terms. What we're gonna do is we're gonna let fn, a function, be a n. So we're gonna let a function be your terms. Essentially what this is saying is we are going to replace n with x. And that's how you get a function in terms of x, okay? And we wanna check that f is continuous, positive, and decreasing. That is very important. If your function is not continuous, positive, and decreasing, we can't use the integral test, okay? So assuming your function is continuous, positive, decreasing, then this is what the integral test says. If I find the integral from one to infinity, so notice that those are the bounds for your series, right? And that integral converges. So remember you learned about improper integrals in week one. Then if that integral converges, then the series converges. And it's an if and only if, meaning that if your integral converges, your series converges. If your series converges, this improper integral converges. And the opposite is true. If the integral diverges, then the series diverges, okay? So we're gonna use integral tests when you look at your terms and you see that it looks like some kind of function you can integrate, then we're gonna use integral tests. So let's take a look at an example here, number 12. Determine whether this series converges or diverges. Now, I'm looking at this and it looks kind of complicated, especially when there's a lawn or an e to the something. Usually that's integral test, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let f at x be a function. I'm literally just gonna take my terms and replace n with x. So this is ln x over x. Remember, you have to check your three conditions. Is it continuous? Is it positive? Is it decreasing? You have to check this before you use the integral test, okay? So let's see here. On the interval from three to infinity, 
doesn't matter what number I plug in for x, as long as x is between 3 and infinity, it's going to be continuous, right? The only parts of this function is discontinuous is if I have a 0 in the denominator. That's not included in our domain. Or ln of a um, negative number, but n starts at 3. So we do see that it's continuous. It's positive because x goes from 3 to infinity. All of these are going to be positive numbers. And it's also decreasing. And you can check this by looking, thinking of the graph of ln x and x. You could be more analytical. You could use derivatives. But usually, we just think of the graph. Ln x kind of tapers off as it goes up. x shoots up like a straight line. So x actually grows faster. So this number down here is going to get larger faster. So the whole number is going to get smaller, right? So it's decreasing. Okay. So check those three conditions. And then we can use the integral test. The integral test says, OK, let's find the improper integral from 3 to infinity of this function. And we're going to see if this converges. If it does, then our series converges. If it diverges, then our series diverges. OK, so let's go ahead and find this integral. I know I personally have not reviewed improper integrals with you, but improper integrals isn't that bad. It just means that whenever you have an infinity, in one of your integration bounds or integration limits, just set the limit as t goes to infinity and replace that infinity with a t. That's it. That's the only difference between a regular integral and an improper integral. You just replace that infinity with a t. Okay. Now let's go through some integration. Normally, I would let you try this. But just for time's sake, I'm so sorry. The first tutorial is a little bit more rushed because I want to make sure we're catching up so you can do your assignments. If you struggle with integration, message me. I will go through them with you, OK? For this one, since we have a ln x, and remember, the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, which we do see here. We're actually going to use a u substitution here. So I'm going to let u be our ln x. So du is going to be 1 over x dx. Since I have bounds as well, I'm going to replace these. So when x equals 3, my u, well, u is ln x, so that's going to become a ln 3. When x equals t, the upper bound, my u is going to be ln t. Now I'm ready to substitute everything in. So we have the limit as t goes to infinity. Now in my integral, instead of 3 to t, it's going to go from ln 3 to ln t. And then instead of ln x, I'm going to replace it with an x, or sorry, with a u. And then instead of 1 over x dx, I'm going to replace it with a du. Now that is a lot nicer to integrate. So let's go ahead and do that. The integral of u, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent. It becomes u squared. Divide by the new exponent. If you're finding that really rush, what I just did, message me or stay after the session and let me know, and then I can go through it with you. But I'm assuming that most of the integration technique is OK. I think a lot of you guys in physics also, you're doing integration, right? So hopefully, this is more review. Now let's evaluate this definite integral. So limit as t goes to infinity, you're going to sub in the top, sub in the bottom, and subtract. So this is going to become ln t squared over 2 minus ln 3 squared over 2. What happens as t goes to infinity? What are we going to get? Write that down. As t goes to infinity. You replace your t with infinity, right? What is ln of infinity? Think about the ln graph. Ln graph gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So as t goes to infinity, the ln t value, the y value, also goes to infinity. So this becomes infinity square over 2, which is infinity, minus some number. This number isn't even going to make a dent. So this is infinity. So that means that the improper integral diverges. So by the integral test, 
our series also diverges. Okay. But if instead you ended up with a single number, for example, you ended up with the integral, the improper integral equals three, then we would say that, okay, since the improper integral converges, our series also converges. But be very, very careful here. I'm going to scroll back up because I want to point this out and you guys to write this down. If the improper integral converges, yes, we know that the series converges, but they don't have to converge to the same number. So don't assume. Let's say you got that the um, improper integral converges to five. All we know is that the series also converges. We have no idea what the series converges to. Okay. So, so far, if we are asked to figure out what a series converges to, the only way to do that is if the series is a geometric series, because then we have a formula, or if it's some kind of telescoping sum, because then we can cancel out all the middle terms. But all the other tests just shows you whether something converges or diverges. It doesn't tell you what it converges to. Okay. Okay. There's one more application when it comes to the integral test, and that is the series remainder, or some people will call it the error given by the integral test. So this is what it says. Suppose we have some series, a n, and it converges. So I'm telling you, hey, when you add up a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on, it converges. It becomes some number. Okay. And you know that fn equals a n. So I can rewrite my function f at x to equal my terms, just like we did in the last example, where f at x is a positive, continuous, and decreasing function. Then this is what it says. S minus s k, meaning the series the sum of a1, a2, a3, all the way up to infinity, minus the first k term. So minus a1, a2, up to ak. That difference is less than or equal to the integral from k to infinity of the function. So in other words, if we try to approximate what the sum equals using a partial sum, because a partial sum, I'm allowed to just add up k terms, right? If I'm able to approximate my series with the partial sum, I'm approximating. There's going to be an error there. That error is going to be less than the integral between k and infinity of f at x dx. That's what that's saying. Okay. So this is the type of question they can ask you. So suppose we are approximating a series using a partial sum. What is the least number of terms that is needed to guarantee an error that is less than 0.01? So they're telling us what the error is and they're asking us, okay, do I need the first 100 terms? Do I need the first 1000? How big of a partial sum do I need so that I get a really small error of 0 0.01? That's what they're asking. So we're gonna use a series remainder, this inequality right here. We want the error to be less than 0 0.01. Well, we know that the error is going to be less than the integral. So that means we want to set the integral from k to infinity of f at x dx to be less than 0 0.01. And we want to solve for k because we want to figure out how many partial sums is needed. Okay. So here, since the series is 1 over e to the n, I'm going to let f at x be 1 over e to the x. And you should check that it is um, continuous on this interval, which it is, right? e to the x is continuous, greater than 0. 1 over something greater than 0 is continuous. You want to show that it's positive, which again, it is in this case. And then you want to show that it's decreasing. Okay. e to the x is getting larger and larger and larger. So 1 divided by e to the x is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So it is decreasing. So we checked all three. So let's find the integral of it. <clears throat> so this is the integral from k to infinity of 1 over e to the x. I'm just going to rewrite it as e to the negative x so that it's easier to integrate. The integral of e is super nice. It's just e, right? 
But then since we have a negative x, e to the negative x, we need to divide by negative one or multiply by negative one. So again, I'm using some integration techniques that you guys learned before. If you have questions about it, let me know. I'm happy to answer that. Okay, so let's evaluate this. Um, technically, I should have written the limit as t goes to infinity and then replace this infinity with t, but I'm just going to sub it in because it, it works the same way. So this is negative e to the negative infinity minus negative e to the negative k. And I want that to be less than 0 0.01. Well, something, a number to the negative infinity, think about the E graph. E looks like this. As X goes towards negative infinity, it's gonna approach zero. So this thing is zero. So this becomes E to the negative K is less than 0 0.01. So one over E to the K is less than 0 0.01. Again, you're solving an inequality. When you have a fraction, we flip the fraction and we switch the inequality sign, right? Whenever you flip the fraction, the inequality sign changes. Oops, and then flipping one over 0 0.01 is 100. Finally, solving for E, I can just take the ln of both sides and we see that K has to be greater than ln of 100. And just so you know, you can use your calculator to, to figure this out, but ln of 100, this is 4.6. Therefore, we need k to equal 5 because k is the number of partial sums. We need the fifth partial sum. That's how we can guarantee that the approximation error is less than 0 0.01, okay? So that's all the time we have today, but this should really help you with your first, uh, your second assignment and also the third assignment that is due next Monday. I know we still have to cover a uh, comparison test. I'm gonna cover it next week. So give it a try, you know, some of the assignment questions. Um, next week, we'll cover comparison tests and you'll have everything you need. Okay, if you have questions, please let me know. I'll be here, I'll stick around. If you have further questions, just send me and, uh, an email. I can always help you there. Okay, thanks for spending time with me. Hopefully that helped. Um, and hopefully I'll see you guys next week. Okay. Um, okay, so some questions coming in. Can you explain why we set the error to less than the interval? Yeah, absolutely. So for this particular question, this uses the series remainder um, theorem from the interval test. So what this is saying is that the error, right? Because the sum, the series sum, if we know what that is, we don't have to guess. If we know what that is, that's what it is. But the thing is, we don't know what the series adds up to. So we are going to approximate it using the kth partial sum. We're going to add up the first k terms. So there's going to be a little error there. They're telling us that the error is going to be less than the integral from k to infinity of f at x dx. That's just a theorem. That's what they're telling us. Now, in this particular question, they're saying, what is the least number of terms that is needed to guarantee that an error is less than 0 0.01? So we want our error to be less than 0 0.01. But we know the error is going to be less than this meaning that we want the integral to be less than 0 0.01. Okay, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, scroll back up to the answer. Yes, sorry, I scrolled too fast. I'm gonna, I think that is what you need. If you need me to scroll up or down more, just uh, let me know. Uh, where do we get the negative e? Yeah, absolutely. So that was some uh, integration techniques here. So as an aside, why don't I do this? So when I'm integrating, e to the negative x dx like that, you could use a u substitution. You let u be the negative x, right? Because we don't just have e to the x, we have e to the negative x. So you could let u be negative x. But there's a shortcut when it comes to u substitution. And that says that if your x term is just changing by a linear factor, meaning your x is still to the power of one, then what we can do is just find the integral of the regular e to the x, which is e to the x, right? It doesn't change. And then you divide by the derivative, which is negative one. So I'll give you a couple more examples so you see the pattern. If I'm integrating e to the two x, the integral of e is just e, and then I divide by the derivative of two x, which is two. It works for other functions too. For example, if I'm integrating cos of three x plus one, 
well, I know the integral of cos is sine, but now I need to divide by the derivative of 3x plus 1, so I need to divide by 3. So that's the u substitution shortcut whenever you just have a linear term, meaning x is still to the power of 1, you can use the shortcut. Okay. Um, uh, still having trouble with the difference between taking the limit of a sequence versus a series. Yeah, absolutely. I was really confused too when I first learned this, trust me. So when you're given a sequence, okay, so I'll just go back up. Um, Sequence, sequence, one second, that's a series. When you're given a sequence, there's no summation, like the sum thing doesn't exist here, there's no sum. So if you're given a sequence, you're just given a list of numbers. And if you're asked to figure out if the sequence converges, essentially you have all these numbers, right? Pretend you're plotting the numbers on a line here. Some numbers are bigger and then they get smaller maybe, or bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. You wanna see if the numbers eventually approach one single number. So that's why we find the limit of the sequence. So we just find the limit of your ANs, that's it, okay? But when it comes to a series, let's take a look at that. When it comes to a series, now you have your summation thing, meaning I'm not just looking at a number, a number, a number. I'm looking at a bunch of numbers being added together. So instead of looking at, for example, one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, and so on, I'm looking at one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth. So a series has these additions, the sum, okay? So if you're asked to figure out if a series converges, we can't just find the limit of each term because each of the terms can go to zero, but I still don't know what the sum is. So that's why we have to find the limit of the partial sums, and that will tell us what the series converges to. Okay, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, can we go over question two? Absolutely. Let me just go back up. Uh, right here, mathematical induction, right? So um, mathematical induction, there's three big steps. I know your class, a lot of profs teach it in two. Three just makes it easier, I think. So three steps here, you have your base case, your hypothesis, and your induction step. Base case is always going to be n equals the smallest number. When I say smallest number, you are going to look at what statement they gave you. The statement will have a sum in there. It will have a sigma most of the time. And you're going to look at what that case is. So they're telling us i equals 1. So that's why we're letting base case be n equals 1. There could be other statements out there. For example, just as an example, they could say, hey, a1 equals 3 a n plus one equals two a n or whatever. They give you some kind of statement. In this case, the base case is also n equals one because the smallest a value they gave you is one. So we need to check the base case. So whatever equation they gave you, whatever statement they gave you, break it down into left side and right side and check what happens when n equals one. So the left side, when n equals one, we get two times one minus one, which is one. The right side is one squared, which is also one. Right? So the base case is checked. Um, then we need our hypothesis. Our hypothesis, you're going to just let n equals k. It's always going to be n equals k. And you're not trying to do any work. You're not trying to prove left side equals right side here. You're just saying, okay, let's assume this statement, whatever it is, is true for n equals k. So I'm literally just replacing my n's with k's and I write down what that statement is. So I'm assuming this is true. And then step three is where the hard work comes in. Step three, we are going to let n be k plus one, and then we wanna show that left side equals right side. So that's exactly what I did here. I took the left side of the equation and I replaced the n with a k plus one. So we ended up with this. And then I wanna show that it equals the right side. So I'm gonna break it down. Well, if I'm adding up i equals 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to k plus 1, the first k terms where i goes from 1 to k is just this thing, right? It's the sum where i goes from 1 to k of 2i minus 1. And then I have the k plus 1 term, the k plus first term, which is 2 times i, which is k plus 1, minus 1. Now, remember our hypothesis? We're going to use that here. We saw that the sum of the first k terms is just k squared, so that's how I wrote down the k squared. And then once you simplify, you get this thing, 
Now do the same thing to the right hand side. I'm just going to take my equation and whatever is on the right hand side, replace the n with a k plus one. And that's what we get. And then we show that left side equals right side, meaning it's true. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, let me know. Um, the recordings will be processed and emailed to you over the next few days. They probably just need a day or two to process it. So keep an eye out for an email, but don't rely on the recordings though, because this is the only week that we'll be releasing the recordings. Starting next week, recordings will not be released for security reasons. All right. Um, question about this one. Does N always equal K plus one in your induction step? Yes. In your third step, when you're actually trying to show um, that this is true, you're going to let n be your k plus one. Okay. But put it into the equation. So this is where it gets a little iffy. So for example, if your equation was a n plus one equals two a n, then when you replace n with k plus one, notice what happens. You're going to get a k plus two, right? So replace n with k plus one. Let me know if that makes sense. Uh, page seven. Yep. Page seven. Here we go. Yeah, this one's a little tricky. So a lot of the definitions, I'm assuming you want the question in page seven. So I'm going to go through that. Let's get rid of some stuff here. Okay. So this one says that the sequence is defined by a1 equals two, and then the nth plus one term, so a n plus one, is a third times a n minus one. Okay, and in part A, according to the monotonic sequence theorem, what conditions must the sequence meet for it to be convergent? Now, the monotonic sequence theorem says two things. It says that the sequence has to be bounded and monotonic, then it will converge. So those are the two conditions, bounded and monotonic. So for something to be bounded, the condition is that each term has to be less than or equal to some finite number m, and greater or equal to some lowercase m, some number m, okay? So that's the bounded condition. The monotonic condition, well, if you look at your terms here, I actually wrote up the first few. So a1 is two, a2 is one third a n minus one, a3, you sub in the a2 into here, you're gonna get negative two over nine. You plug in negative two over nine, you're gonna get the next term, which is negative 11 over 27 and so on. So the numbers are getting smaller and smaller. So the condition for it to be monotonic, we need to show that it's monotonically decreasing. So the condition is that each term is getting smaller and smaller. So a n plus one is less than or equal to a n. Now in part B, they're saying, okay, we wanna use mathematical induction to show that the sequence meets these two conditions, meaning that it's bounded and monotonically decreasing. And they're asking us to write down, just write down the hypothesis and the induction step. So I'm actually going to just focus on the monotonic decreasing um, hypothesis and induction step, the bounded one, once you understand the monotonic one, the bounded one's much easier. So for monotonically decreasing, meaning we want to show this, we want to show that a n is greater or equal to a n plus one. The hypothesis, we're going to let n equals k. So I'm replacing these n's with k's. So I get a k is greater than or equal to a k plus one. But I also have formulas for this. You remember our statement, our formula? It says that a n plus one is a third times a n minus one. So if you think of it as replacing the n with a k, then we see that a k plus one is actually a third a k minus one. So a k plus one is a third times a k minus one. So this is our hypothesis. We're assuming that this is true. Then the induction step, we want to show that it is true for the case when n equals k plus 1. So again, I'm going to replace my n with a k plus 1, replace my n with a k plus 1. So now I have a k plus 1 is greater or equal to a k plus 2. But then again, we have our formulas, remember? So we go back to our formula. The formula says that a k plus 1 is the same as 1 third a k minus 1. So a k plus one is a third a k minus one. And then the a k plus two, I'm just going to add one to my index, right? So it's a third a k plus one minus one. So that's what we're trying to show. 
Okay, I'm not going to actually show it because they just wanted you to write down the hypothesis and the induction step. So that's it. Okay, let me know if that makes sense. Okay, so there's a couple of you guys still here. If you have questions, please email me. Hopefully you find that helpful. No problem. Yeah, you're really welcome. Um, if you found it helpful, come back next week. Bring your friends because we need a certain number for us to keep offering these. So uh, yeah, good luck with uh, your studies this week. Good luck with the assignment. And I'll see you next week.